You're in the right place. Hello, I'm Dan Harris. Hi, and I'm Claudia Kostler. You're over here, over there. Welcome to Over Here, Over There, a global conversation about how we see ourselves and how others see us. I'm your host, Dan Harris, and for the next 45 minutes or so, we'll be asking our panel from Germany, the UK, and USA about our topic of conversation today, which is, is international education the best investment? This is a recorded podcast, but you can send us your feedback via our website at overhereoverthere.org or on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. The value of international education cannot be overstated. It changes one's perspective, opens opportunities, and provides enriching, edifying experiences. But it also has other benefits, such as a wider choice of education, greater affordability in some cases, and looks good on the CV or resume. Mine is a biased view, but let's discuss with our panel and get a fuller picture of the advantages and challenges of international education, what they are today. I'm joined by my fellow podcaster, Claudia Kussler, Senior Editor at the Süddeutsche Zeitung in Munich. Claudia grew up in Bavaria and has lived and studied abroad in California, London, and Iceland. She speaks Icelandic as well, I might add. Ja. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Claudia, wh what are the factors going through a German student's mind when considering university education? Is going abroad a popular choice? Absolutely. I personally only know maybe a handful of fellow students who did not opt for a time abroad. The vast majority did. Wasn't it Oscar Wilde that said travel improves the mind wonderfully and does away with all one's prejudice? That is still used as an argument here uh, for studying abroad. The chance to travel to other countries and is a possibility to broaden your own horizons. Uh, a study visit makes it possible to immerse yourself in a culture and such in-depth impressions are not usually gained when you're just on a holiday. So uh, it is a popular option for German students to go abroad. Joining us are our guest, Anthony Nemesek, a fellow American who is a chief educational consultant at Banyan Educational Services based in London, which advises students on their university career and application process in the UK, USA, Canada, and other countries. Anthony was also the director of the prestigious Fulbright Commission in London, uh, representing over 4,000 higher education institutions and promoting education in the USA, as well as the highly sought after Fulbright Scholarship. He is co-author of Uni in the USA and Uni in the USA and Beyond, uh, published by The Good Schools Guide. Lucas Publications Limited, and writes frequently for the British National Press. We're delighted to have Dale Scarborough, another American, originally from the beautiful state of Virginia, and teaches history at St. Edward's Senior School in Cheltenham in the UK, and was career and university admissions advisor there for many years. Dale specializes in, you can correct me, Dale, if I'm wrong, Elizabethan England? Sorry, 17th century but not that there's that much difference. Thank you very much for that correction. And 16th and 17th European history. He's also author of several books, including A History of the Vietnam War. So welcome and thank you all for being virtually over here and over there. Our listeners will hear three Americans and one German voice, but I can assure you we're international jet setters, all of us. So three of us have lived 30 years or more in the UK and while Claudia is in Germany and can claim four World Cups in the best beer in the world. So there you go. <laughs> Not personally, but post. <laughs> <laughs> Anthony, if I can turn to you, can you tell us a bit more about Banyan Educational Consultants? Because it's, it positions itself between the EU and USA, uh, advising students on both sides of the Atlantic. Can you tell us more? I, I, there's been a dramatic increase in the past few years in regard to options that students have, be it UK students, Europeans, Americans. Um, and because of that growth, we position ourselves to work with students primarily at the university level, although we do deal with uh, primary and secondary school and postgraduate as well. But in regard to universities, uh, to assist them to determine not only what their options are, but how appropriate each of those particular pathways might be. Students tend to only know 
the system from which they come, which is logical. Um, and while they may fancy the idea of studying abroad, um, they don't often fully understand the differences between the educational systems. And it's part of our our work and our goal that before they make those type of decisions, which obviously will have implications, um, hopefully mostly could, but there will be financial and other considerations, um, that they're doing so with their eyes wide open. Um, nothing could be worse than a student simply pursuing something to discover once enrolled that it wasn't the, the best option for their particular needs and their goals. And we're talking about a full degree, a three or four year degree, not a semester or year abroad that, right. that, you, no. that you handle. Yeah. Right. No, we're not talking about short-term exchange. Um, most of those types of programs are dealt institutionally. We're, we're talking about students who are interested in making the commitment to a full uh, degree program. We've all either worked in it, uh, international education, or experienced it ourselves. If I could go to Dale, what do you tell students as far as looking at your options for studying overseas? Because you advise students at coming out of GCSEs and A-levels in the UK, that's uh, the ages of 16, 17, and 18, uh, that Dale deals with. Thanks, Dan. I think, um, well, if I was giving them advice about what to consider about this, that my first consideration would be the end goal whether they've got some particular career interest that would be better served by going to university abroad, whether in Europe or in the United States. And in some cases, that might be the case. Um, we have had students from our school go to university in Holland, for example, uh, because they wanted to study international law uh, and European law in particular. So that was, you know, going to the University of Maastricht was a, a, a simple call for them, and it turned out to be a very good move. Um, but I would also sort of back up what Claudia said about just expanding people's horizons uh, and understanding that the world isn't just the world that you grew up in, but that there's uh, a whole range of different cultures and interests out there to be explored. Um, again, we have a number of American students in my school. And what I see really clearly time and time again is how you take a, a young child out of the United States and within six months, they're looking back at their own country very differently than they ever would have done if they'd stayed put. So I mm. think, um, you know, giving them the advice, obviously they have to weigh all sorts of things in the balance, um, not least of which is the cost of going abroad, but we you know, discuss that later. And I don't necessarily advise people to go abroad. You know, my, my job as UCAS advisor is also to sort out all of the university applications in the UK. Um, but there are, from time to time, you get students who either come to you and express an interest, uh, especially if you, you know, you've given a, a talk about how it's done and what the possibilities are, to try to just open their eyes to the possibility of doing it and then um, take it from there, really. Claudia, are, are German students encouraged to consider international education, or is it more of a stay-at-home kind of attitude? No, not at all. It is absolutely encouraged, and uh, there are quite a lot of options nowadays to do so. Uh, they're among scholarships like Erasmus or from the DAAD, which is the German Academic Exchange Service. And the reasons why it is encouraged are multifold. Um, as I said before, it will let you to mature as a person. Um, you can immerse yourself in other cultures, but it will also enable you uh, to a lot of soft skills, such as flexibility and uh, independence and communication skills. So it is all about intercultural competence in a way. And also the fact that you are studying abroad can have a positive effect on a later job opportunity. Uh, it can look good on a, on a CV, as you said before, that uh, should not be underestimated. So it is absolutely encouraged here. Anthony and, and others can come in on this. We have to just from the top, I'd say, given that we're in a pandemic, which is looks like it's going to last for quite a long time and its effects will be lasting for years, probably. What effect has it had, Anthony, on the numbers and students considering going overseas? It's going to be quite some time before we fully realize the impact. 
Um, but contrary to what I would have thought, I, I mean, logically, I assumed that students would be more hesitant um, or concerned when, in fact, uh, we have seen more interest than we've seen over the past few years. We're busier now than we've ever been. Um, and I think part of that has to do with, first of all, people feeling that while this pandemic is, is having negative impact, um, it will end. And when it does, the world is potentially going to be a different place. And they've had more time uh, to fully consider because they haven't been, for all intents and purposes, in full-time education as they've known it. Uh, they have more time to discuss with their families uh, about what they're going to do next. What if my exams are canceled? What is, how is all of this going to impact me? And so they're starting to look more thoroughly, which I think is a very positive impact, at what their futures um, could be and, and where they might be. Um, now, in terms of how immediately affected um, higher education, particularly in the U.S., international student numbers were down significantly for, I mean, I think we can all understand the hesitancy of anyone wanting to travel or not even being able to travel when, when borders were closed, although students were still able to go if their universities were open. Um, so we have right now, as in, in any system, a lot of students studying online, um, but the goal is by American higher education to get them back to campus as soon as possible and but in terms of you know you had institutions who were enable who were able to uh, take in their their classes and the numbers were were different were skewed because either students decided not to attend or were attending virtually and how that's going to impact the coming years in terms of how many students are going to be accepted or not accepted I, it's quite confusing, and no one is particularly sh sure <laughs> of what's, what the future holds. I, I can tell you that in this current application cycle, numbers in terms of applications in the U.S. are significantly up. Some universities are seeing as much as 60% more applicants than they have in the past. Wow. That's counterintuitive in a way, isn't it? Well, it is. And... and uh, is that because of online learning, maybe? Is that, no, I know that, that, that uh, we haven't talked about it, but obviously the application process for the U.S. is far more complicated than what you tend to find in, in the U.K. or in Europe or elsewhere. And there are one, one component historically has been the need to take SAT or ACT testing. And because of the difficulty with administering those exams, Many institutions in the U.S. are now saying that, at least for this coming year, potentially longer, students will no longer be able to do that. Well, historically, having to actually prepare or to sit those exams has been an immediate roadblock for many students. They weren't going to invest the time. They weren't going to pay the money, et cetera. And so now, you know, they're thinking, well, I don't have to really do anything extra, so why don't I put in an application? Which, unfortunately, is, is not the thing to do because the U.S. application process in particular is not just about a test result. Um, all the other components still need to be in place. And if they're coming to the table very last minute, they're not going to be able to provide a, a CV, if you will, that's going to make them an admissible candidate for the more competitive institutions. It's a project plan, isn't it? When you, when you apply to a U.S. university, uh, particularly those larger institutions, each one is not a simple affair. It's costly, usually, and... It's time-consuming. It's very time-consuming. And, time -consuming. and, and it really does... I mean, in a perfect world, I would advocate that students begin preparation two years in advance. And, and that's counter to what generally tends to happen in the UK, for example, um, where a discussion about university 
tends to happen around the end of GCSEs so that students can make appropriate choices for their A-levels or their IBs that will align to a potential course at university. Um, and here, you know, we're saying, let's start before. Um, and most students aren't even thinking about this because it's not common, if you will. So when they decide, oh, this could be an option, oftentimes they don't have enough time or they're under too much pressure with all of the other demands that they have academically, et cetera. And so that was the going back to my earlier point about how the pandemic may be helping students. Well, they are starting to think about these options sooner. And so they do have the time to prepare um, and to put together what will be required to be a viable candidate. Dale, can you relate to that? Yes, I certainly can. I mean, you asked whether a student in the UK needs a project plan for an application to American universities. And uh, of course, Anthony, everything you said is just, you know, bears out my limited experience of doing it. I think that British kids need to remember that the United States is a free enterprise culture. So there isn't just one body like UCAS as there is in the UK to gather applications and send them out. The name of the game in the States is competition, competition between universities and between different systems of application. So although you've got the what's called the common application form, which does uh, cater for many universities, but there are also lots of other platforms that need to be explored by a British student who's considering this move. Uh, alongside the ACTs and SATs, and as you say, I don't know how that has uh, actually been impacted by this. Coming back to the general point about the pandemic, looking at it from just from this country's perspective, Britain's perspective, but I would certainly say that in the UK, a lot more students are now applying for deferred entry. Uh, if the experience of this year's freshers is taken into account and the scenes that we all saw on television from you know, Manchester and other universities where students were more or less herded into their halls of residence as soon as they arrived and more or less imprisoned in them with the best of reasons, but with the worst of outcomes. It doesn't make much sense for student at the moment to start applying to university unless they know that this is over. So I would predict that there's going to be a wave in the coming year of students who held back from applying to university this year just to see how this panned out. I don't what the implications of that are for the universities, both in the UK and abroad, I don't know. I mean, it may be that our experience of studying online is going to change things significantly. I know that my son, who's currently studying history at the University of Birmingham, he's doing all of his work at the moment online, including exam, tests, essays, um, lectures, everything is being done online. And if it can be done online, then it can be done online. So maybe, you know, universities in the future may be changing the way that they do things. And that in itself might make it easier for students to study abroad. I don't know. We'll just have to see what happens. Well, interestingly enough, the, the feedback that we're getting from students is they hate that. <laughs> they, <laughs> I'm not surprised. <laughs> that, 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 that they really don't want to pay money to be online, that, that what they're looking for is to be a member of a community. And, you know, maybe that's what's also driving this is that desire to return to the way things were. Um, yes, uh, online delivery can be very efficient. And it has existed for quite some time, even within the UK, if you look at the open university, et cetera. And, and it's great, but it tends to suit those who perhaps already have families or who are working during the day. That's a wonderful um, solution. But for currents, for young people who are very social, et cetera, they're, they're not pleased. <laughs> oh, I, can, I can back that up. My son is definitely not happy with the situation. And Claudia, in, in Germany, for both domestic and students looking abroad, are they deferring? What, what's happening there? We don't have any numbers yet to uh, back me up here. But as a gut feeling, I'd say they are holding back a little bit, but not as much as 
possibly anticipated before because um, a lot of uh, the studies here uh, or the courses here are done online as well. So everything has shifted to digital learning. And uh, so students are still able to uh, do their courses and do their work. But of course, there have been restrictions when going abroad. And that has, uh, of course, implicated things and made it difficult. So unfortunately, I do not have any numbers to back it up. But constant stream of German students abroad that has stopped in a way. I personally know only um, of one student. He's a, a currently uh, a German student in Oxford, and he had significant problems uh, going back and forth and uh, stayed one, I think it's a trimester, not a semester there. He stayed one uh, trimester uh, over here in Germany while studying online um, and having his courses there. But it was a bit of, uh, of hassle because he missed the interactions, he missed a lot of the surroundings, the academic world in a way. It was all restricted to his bedroom and his laptop. So uh, he wasn't as content as uh, when uh, the lockdown was lifted again and he could be there. But uh, overall, yes, it has affected the way uh, students went on. Um, it was a bit more uh, home prone in a way. Uh, but I, I'm absolutely Absolutely sure. Once the pandemic is uh, truly over and done with, there will be a stream of students flocking out and uh, trying to regain the world in a way. You're listening to Over Here, Over There, and I'm your host, Dan Harris, with fellow podcaster Claudia Kussler, senior editor of the Sudoitu Zeitung, and our guests, Anthony Nemechek from Banyan Educational Consultancy, and Dale Scarborough, history teacher and career advisor at St. Edward's Senior School in Cheltenham, UK. And our topic of discussion is international education, the best investment. Anthony, I'm curious about access to international education. I guess the perception of it is when I was dealing with international education, people just thought it wasn't accessible to them. It was too expensive. And that's even just for a year abroad or a semester abroad, let alone three or four year degree. How do you find it? What would you what would you say as far as his accessibility goes? What do you what do you tell students? Well, that actually varies. I mean, if you look at what's happened in the UK, uh, let's say over the past 10 or 15 years, when students for a variety of reasons, became more interested. I mean, be it because of fee increases at UK institutions or availability of Erasmus or other programs within Europe or the US. In terms of finance, that's, I think, one of the reasons why Europe has become more popular um, because the, the fees are more aligned to the UK and yet they still can engage and get all of these wonderful benefits that we've been discussing about international exposure or uh, perhaps, as Dale mentioned, a, a degree that is offered that is unique, that would be beneficial for their particular interests. Um, and in regard to the U.S., I mean, yes, obviously, it, it's more expensive. But assuming first that they could afford it, students are becoming more sophisticated, as are their parents, in regard to value for money. What am I paying for? And if we look at, just as one example, uh, contact time, how many hours per week am I going to see my professors? And in the UK, that amount is significantly lower on many courses than it will be elsewhere. So if I'm paying potentially up to 9,000 pounds per year and I'm going to see my professor only six to eight hours a week versus if I go to Europe or the US and I'm going to be seeing a professor for 15 to 20 hours per week, students are, are more sophisticated and, and can see that they're perhaps getting bigger, as you might say, getting bigger bang for their buck. In addition to that, there are a wealth of financial upper to, uh, grants and scholarships, et cetera, at U.S. institutions. Uh, I'm not going to lie or mislead students in particular, because I think a lot of times we hear that and think, oh, we can go for free. No, it's extremely competitive. There are only really four institutions in the U.S. that are what they call need blind, meaning that they 
will fully fund you if your family finances are such that you couldn't afford to go. Are those private institutions? Yes, well, of, of course. course. Um, because a state, what they would call a state institution in the U.S. can't give money to someone from out of state, be it if I'm in Ohio, I can't give money to New York, a New Yorker, nor can I give it to a German. Um, but the four that do, other than those four, most are going to be what we call need sensitive, meaning that when it comes time to your app, when you're applying in admissions, I'm balancing what you're bringing to the table in terms of your student perspective, as well as your family's ability to pay. And, you know, so the, it's not as if you can go anywhere and they're going to fund you. However, there are there are places. The uh, one other point that I'd like to make is that the fees that you often hear about in the U.S. are what they actually call the sticker price. Mm. Um, and just like when you go to buy a car, <laughs> yes, you, you're not necessarily going to pay what it says on the window. Yes, Claudia, do you know, uh, sorry, Claudia, do you know that phrase, sticker price? Yes, <laughs> I'm familiar yeah, with they that. Put, they put the price, all the prices on the car window, <laughs> on the window, it's a sticker. They stick it on the window just to, just to explain. Sorry, Anthony, continue, please. That's fine. Yeah. No, no, no. And so, you know, what you have are institutions that will heavily discount those fees if they can as a way to lure more students or to make it more feasible for students to attend. Um, but in addition to that, there, there are many, many unique uh, scholarship opportunities, which while are unlikely to fully fund a student, it will make their fees perhaps more comparable to their home country, be it the U.S. or I mean, be it the U.S., the U.K., Europe, Asia. Um, and so once again, it goes back to how well informed students are going into the process about what is actually possible. Dale, you're in a private school in the UK. How much of an issue when it comes to when they look abroad in comparison to the 9,000 tuition that they have to pay at most universities here, do they consider that uh, possible or do they just, is that a turnoff? Well, I think they do consider the possibility. I mean, if you'd asked me 20 years ago whether any students from our school were going to America, to American universities, I'd have said, no, they're not. If you'd asked me 40 years ago, I'd have said that they'd never even seen an American, except on television. Uh, but today, although we've got a small sixth form, I think in the lower six, we've got 30 students. Two of those students are actively pursuing the uh, idea of applying to American universities. So the financial situation isn't necessarily something that will put them off. But I do think that, um, again, from my personal experience of our students, those who have gone to America usually have had some kind of sports scholarship to help them through, whether in uh, something like rugby or hockey, particularly rugby, I think, which I gather is a, is a you know a sport of uh, increasing interest in the United States. And talking about cost, Claudia, I was looking at some statistics last night in, in, about Germany and cost of a German uh, university three or four year degree, sometimes it's free for certain institutions, not, not necessarily for private, but those more public in Germany. Of course, if you're a EU citizen, you, you can go to a German university like a German student and not have to pay. But even if you're not uh, a German, if you're uh, a foreigner, a US student coming across, the, the fees are not as di dire as <laughs> what they'd experience back home. Is that right? Absolutely, quite right. Despite being among global leaders in higher education, the, the cost of studying college in Germany is quite affordable. Basically, you can say college education in Germany is free. It was in uh, 2014 that the government uh, abolished international fees in all public colleges. So there are no tuition fees for bachelor's and master's programs, except if you plan to pursue a master's degree that focuses on a different subject than the one you studied as a bachelor's student. And the uh, free tuition system here is available to all foreign students, regardless of uh, their country of origin. Um, there is only one exception, and that is in the federal state of Baden-Württemberg. Um, they have uh, reintroduced tuition fees of uh, 3,000 euros a year, 
I think it was back in 2017 that they did it. But don't be misled. There are, of course, some other payments you have to consider when you come here. Because there is a small amount of money you have to consider for an administrative fee, for example, that is uh, commonly known as a semester contribution. And uh, this is uh, ranks between 150 and 250 uh, euros per semester per person. And also you have to consider the costs of living there, such as rent and food and stuff. Most colleges here uh, do not have uh, student halls uh, to provide uh, accommodation. And whole other th uh, thing is when you consider a private college, uh, there are a lot of fees applied in these institutions. Uh, Anthony, what are the chances of a foreign student, a UK student, a German student, uh, hoping to go to the US, just generally, they, if they do reasonably well or very well on the SAT or ACT, and they've done their homework, they've done some research, they've started early in the planning process for, uh, for applying. So they've done all the right things, they apply. What's the chances of getting a scholarship of sorts? And scholarship meaning that tuition is waived. And that's another distinction. When they give a scholarship, it's basically they're given a scholarship against tuition fees, not so necessarily against living expenses, right. correct? Well, you have to remember, it depends on the institution. There, there are two types of financial awards, one being scholarship, which is based uh, on talent, and that could be academic. It could be sport, as Dale mentioned. It could be music. There are a variety of skills and talents that can be rewarded with a scholarship. The other type of award is financial need. So purely based on your family's ability to pay. As I've already said, there are very few institutions who don't look at your finances and will fully fund you regardless. But there are several hundred others that will also fully fund anyone who has, academic, who has financial need that they've accepted. So even though I've made the decision to accept you, even though your family couldn't afford it. Um, but since I've accepted you, I'm going to give you what it takes to get you here. But let me pause just briefly there. Um, what families might think they can afford is not necessarily what universities think that they can afford. So that, that, that's, that's another... That's an interesting point because, you know, when you apply to a U.S. university, you have to spill your guts as far as your financial picture is as a family, you don't do. you? And I mean, you really have to give a lot of absolutely. information. Absolutely. And generally, it works to your favor. But simply because at the end of the month, let's assume that the family has nothing left, uh, that doesn't mean that the university doesn't feel that you actually could find X amount extra. Or because of your property or your potential to be able to get a bank loan, it's a very different process than it is in other parts of the world. So, but yes, I mean, there, there is, there are ample opportunities, um, be it both through scholarship, assuming, and, and here is what students in particular need to remember, um, you have to be a very, very competitive applicant in order that any university is going to fund you to that degree. Um, and, and that definition is different in the U.S. than it might be in particular in the U.K. or in other parts of the world. You know, how students are judged uh, at, at the top institutions in the U.K. is very different the way that the, than the top institutions are going to judge the student applying to the U.S. It's not just about academics and suitability for a particular course, which tend to drive things in the U.K. It's you both inside and outside of the classroom. So, and, and also there's a misunderstanding that because the U.S. tends to follow this, what they call more holistic approach to evaluating students, that somehow academic standards therefore must be less. That's not true. You know, everywhere in the world starts at the same place with the student's academic background. It's just mm. in the U.S. in particular, uh, that's not enough. Then they want to know what else. What are you going to bring to that community? What are you going to participate in? 
how are you going to make that institution a better place? Or what will you do with that education when you leave? And that's a very, very different approach. So uh, like you say, holistic, what kind of investment, both personally, socially, academically, are they going to, you know, are they going to get into the life of the college or the university they're, they're in? It's, it's, not, it's more than, as you said at the very beginning, more than just the ACT and the SAT that they've just scored on. There's just oh, so much more and, than and that. Also, most importantly, why are you applying to that institution? You know, do you understand what it means to go to this university? Why are you applying here? Does it make sense? Does your background match our particular ethos? You know, every year I become so discouraged and actually irate. And you hear this in, on the American news more than anywhere else about the kid who applied to every, who was accepted to every Ivy League school. And they, they tend to want to celebrate, and, and they want to celebrate that, which is foolish. The student is a fool. Because each of those institutions is so different in terms of environment and academics. I mean, the quality might be good, but their specialisms and what students on campus, you couldn't possibly, unless you're schizophrenic, be appropriate for each one of them. So actually, that is wrong. Um, the student hasn't done his or her homework other than going to grab a brand name, which we all also understand. But that's not the way that when you're, when you're applying to the U.S., what U.S. institutions tend to be looking for. They really need to know that you're choosing us or applying to us because you understand us. You're listening to Over Here, Over There, and I'm your host, Dan Harris, with my fellow podcaster, Claudia Kussler, senior editor at the Süddeutsche Zeitung in Munich, and our guest, Anthony Nemechek, chief educational consultant at Banyan Educational Consulting, and Dale Scarborough, who teaches history and is a career and university admissions advisor at St. Edward's School in Cheltenham, UK. And we're discussing, is international education the best investment? Can I just ask all three of you, really, your reaction, though, now... We're post-Brexit, the impact on international education, the Erasmus scheme. Can you just give us your thoughts on that? Dale? Right. Well, I think, uh, Dan, that British students have always been rather insular in their outlook. I think this is something which has been institutionally encouraged, to be honest. Just look at the difficulty that people have encouraging British students to study foreign languages. And I think just leaving the EU is going to make that, um, certainly from the European perspective, considerably more difficult to overcome that idea. I think there is a kind of a built-in bias in the UK towards staying in the UK for university. And it's, this is based on all sorts of past experiences and expectations, um, family experiences too, whether your parents went to university and which universities they went to. Um, it's also made more difficult by the fact that the loan system in this country, you know, it only applies to students who are going to the university in the UK. So when you, when you apply to university and you apply for a student loan, then very quickly you find that you're sort of getting locked into a system that will involve being, you know, paying back that loan over a prolonged period of time uh, at, at reasonably good rates, I have to say. It's, it's probably the best money you'll ever borrow, but it, it does kind of lock you into the system. So when they have to sort of step out of that, uh, you know, they have to accept that the first thing that's going to happen is that they're going to lose the ability to cash in on that loan system and find their finance uh, in other ways. I hope that I'm wrong in saying this, but I suspect that international applications may become more difficult for British students in the next year or so, partly as a result of, of Brexit. Claudia, of course, Germany doesn't have that problem. <laughs> it doesn't have, it's it's one of the mainstays. <laughs> No decks it or gets so it's, it yet. It's not an issue, is it? <laughs> uh, not for a German student. Um, it might be that we see less uh, British students here. I agree with Dale that there uh, might be a decrease in this number due to Brexit. But um, as far as a German student is concerned, uh, there won't be any change. Anthony, what, what, what do you see now? 
I think Dale's points are absolutely spot on. Um, everything that he said in terms of the mindset as well as how it's going to impact. A note uh, about 10 years ago, I used to volunteer my services to, to go all over the UK in particular and speak to schools for students who might be interested in pursuing education in the US because at the time I had just uh, come from Fulbright. And I can't tell you how many heads refused to allow me near their students saying that they, they were gonna go and stay in the UK. Then there was this great shift over the 10 years about being invited by institutions, schools, to, to come and speak to their students. And there was excitement and it was a badge of honor that we had students applying to the US and to Europe. It was, it was valued. And my fear is that because of Brexit is that that will somehow become diminished again or become or the possibility will become lessened because of the other implications and, and hardships, uh, financial in particular, so that international education will become, unfortunately, more based on to a particular group that can afford it versus those that who would benefit from it. And following on what you just said there, and, and for all three of you, maybe Anthony, I'll just have you continue, is that I'm just wondering about the flow. Of course, there's a pandemic and that's disrupting things. But generally, post-pandemic, uh, hopefully, what what's the flow like between, if we just use, uh, we could talk about Asian countries because you know we have a lot of Asian students coming to schools here, both uh, primary, secondary, and university uh, in the UK and in Europe. But anyway, just between the, the, the flow between America and, uh, and the EU, to be honest, I'll just put my cards on the table. There's so many good universities on the continent of, of Europe, and they're also a lot more affordable than, than the US. I know the US has very high standards though as well, but still, uh, if you're thinking about a first degree, even a master's or whatever in a certain subject, and you don't want to have to pay for a quote unquote, almost like a house, <laughs> price as far as uh, education goes back in the states if you go to it and you can't get scholarships uh, or funding or financial aid in the states oh absolutely do you, do you see that do you see the flow going to yeah go ahead sorry uh, absolutely go ahead. um if you as students are smart <laughs> and once again it, it, it's the same way that a lot of uk instant uh, schools previously wanted or thought students should stay in the uk that Many U.S. schools don't even know that there's a world outside the U.S. in terms of higher education. And if a U.S. student, and we're seeing more and more of this, this I find fascinating, really are looking at quality and affordability. And the U.K. and Europe is becoming much more popular. Um, the degrees are shorter. The amount of investment is less the the subject areas they because in the u.s most universities follow the liberal arts approach so whereas in europe and the uk it's more of a discipline approach um the opportunities are ripe and if and it has started i mean we are seeing uk institutions and european institutions trying to recruit in the u.s they're not as sophisticated yet as the machine that the u.s institutions have created, but that will come and it will be driven probably by affordability, which is great. Mm -hmm. The other issue is if you ask anyone in the UK and, and in some parts of Europe to name US universities, they might know three or four. Uh, those will be Harvard, Yale, Stanford, you know, if they, well, Berkeley, that's only if they're UCLA. really sophisticated. <laughs> um, but, and, and, and somehow they pin all of their hopes on that brand name, not recognizing that there are just under 4,000 institutions of higher education in the U.S., and 500 of those will equal uh, the top institutions in many other countries. So, you know, whereas Americans aren't, yes, they're still brand conscious, but they're far more aware of great other brands that international students don't know within the U.S., so they're more willing to look at institutions that maybe they don't know the name of. You know, they, it's not Oxford, it's not Cambridge, it's not the Sorbonne. But, oh, that's an interesting school in Germany. Look, they offer a program that I'm really interested in. And, oh, look, it's costly. And 
the name, when they go back to the States, it's not going to be the calling card that gets them through the door. You know, they're not going to be able to say like, Uh, Many Europeans think if they go to Harvard, then they can come back and say, I went to Harvard and they're going to get a job, which they're not anymore. That used to be the case. They may get an interview still, but there's no longer a guarantee. So whereas the American will go back and it will be so unusual that they've studied for their entire degree in Europe or in the UK, and it must be great. So it can be a real advantage for them. So the cachet... Because they, because they stand out. And, and it's then. not that... Not everyone's yeah. fishing because most Americans aren't going to know the names of institutions outside of the US. That's really interesting, thinking that the um, one of the big draws for British students going to America is the fact that if they do a liberal arts degree, this is the first couple of years, they don't really have to specialize. And that gives them more time to think about who they are and what they want, what they want to do. Um, with the degree when they finished. But the reverse is also true. And if you've got an American student who definitely wants to be, you know, a historian or a geographer mm-hmm. or, a, you know, they can come to a British university and get stuck straight into that. Um, and mm-hmm. as you say, given the fact that it's a three-year course rather than a four-year course, then there may be a sort of financial benefit to that as well. And Claudia, does it stop a German student? Like, for instance, just looking at, you know, hey, it's very affordable in Germany, top universities there as well. Why would you go out if, if you're going to pay, unless you're lucky with some financial aid or scholarship package, why would you go to the States unless you go to Harvard or, you know, you get a full ride there or whatever? Is that Does that stop a lot of German students? I don't think so. Because uh, as it was mentioned before, there is kind of... Uh, this well it might be a little bit a pr thing but once you've been to an internationally globally known university that stands out totally in your cv uh it's like a badge of honor if you were accepted uh, at a university uh, in uh, the us that is uh, known like yale or uh, harvard you stand out uh, if you are accepted at oxford or cambridge so this is something uh, people will look for. Uh, but I think they are um, students nowadays are much more aware that there are more universities out there and the skills they are after are much uh, more than just a, a name, a brand name in a way. They have to acquire uh, skills. They have to acquire the, the skill to be able to communicate on an international level and uh, in order to work on an international level in the future. So they have a more broad interest uh, what colleges might be suitable for that, what courses are there. So there is a little shift there. But overall, the urge to go abroad and uh, prove yourself abroad in a different language, in probably English, and show on an early age that you are willing and interested to work on an international level is there and will increase in the future. We just have a few minutes left. I just want to give everyone the opportunity if they if they want. I mean, we heard Anthony at the end there about the uh, benefits of uh, international education. If you had 30 seconds and can do a, a pitch for international education, what would you say? Anthony, can I, can I ask you first? What I would say is regardless of what a student's ultimate decision is or where he or she um, will study, the benefits are determined by, is it an appropriate choice for you? So for many students, that may mean the short-term international exchange is the best course of action to give them some of the benefits of the skill set that Claudia was discussing, et cetera. For others, it may be doing the full degree outside of your home country. There are advantages and disadvantages to all systems. And what's most important to be successful, not only in your degree, but in your future life, (laughs) not only career, but your life, is to make the decision that's best for your particular goals and and needs. Dale? Yes, uh, thank you. As somebody who crossed the Atlantic several times during my education, um, and ended up going to university in this country, I would say that it undoubtedly broadens your horizons and gives you an internationalist outlook 
um, which in some circumstances may be difficult to get if you remain in your domestic environment. I also sort of think that it's um, really important for people to be able to do this uh, and that anything that we can do to facilitate it would be a good idea. But I think I would also give that this comes with a warning that anyone who spends three or four years abroad at university, they're going to be a changed person when they come back to their own country. And um, mm-hmm. though I would like to think that that's always a beneficial thing, but just to sort of uh, issue a little warning that it might not always work to your advantage. Interesting, taking a balanced view on that one. Claudia, can you, last word to you. Uh, oh, my. <laughs> um, I think uh, one should familiarize uh, oneself with the colleges, with the countries, with the courses, with the possibilities uh, to make an informed decision. Is that the right university, the right course for you. It's not a one-way street, you know. You have to give something back to this college as well, um, as it was mentioned earlier. And if you are able to sort out the uh, financial aspects of it, if you are uh, able to go abroad and study abroad, whether it is a long-term or short-term, just do it because it will be a life-changing experience. It will very likely be a very good one and it will open doors for you that you might never knew that existed and it will give you both a personal and professional advantage in life. You pick up new skills, uh, you are able to work on an international level and also uh, there is a new perspective to life or your origin uh, to be gained. One little point that uh, came quite aware to me, because uh, I'm now in a state where I would like uh, to go back to university sometimes, <laughs> but I'm quite stuck in my work and I don't have the time to do that, uh, to do my PhD. Uh, and I hope I, I will find time later in life. But when you are a student, it is a very significant time in your life. And uh, the possibility to go abroad and to immerse yourself in another country, in another culture, uh, won't come back as easily later in life when obligations increase all of a sudden. So, so take advantage just do when it. you can. Very yeah. good. That's it. That's a great, yeah, that's a great definitely. way to end. So thank you very much for our panel, Claudia Kussler, Senior Editor of the Süddeutsche Zeitung in Munich, and our guest, Anthony Nemetzek, Chief Educational Consultant at Banyan Education Consulting, and Dale Scarborough, who teaches history and is a career and university admissions advisor at St. Edward's Senior School in Cheltenham. Before we close, we'd like to remind our listeners that they can subscribe to our podcast by the button below. Uh, over here, over there can be found on most major podcast platforms. You can also follow us on Twitter, f- Facebook, and Instagram. And today's podcast show notes can be found on our website, overhereoverthere.org. If you want to be a patron, we have a button for that too on our website, and we'd very much appreciate your support. Polite, insightful, humorous, and constructive comments are always welcome in any language, so please be in touch. So check out our website for our next Unmissable podcast. Until then, thank you for listening to Over Here, Over There. Thank you.